Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino, Chapter One. Kublai Khan does not necessarily believe everything Marco Polo says when he describes the cities visited on his expeditions, but the Emperor of the Tartars does continue listening to the young Venetian with greater attention and curiosity than he shows any other messenger or explorer of his. In the lives of emperors, there is a moment which follows pride in the boundless extension of the territories we have conquered, and the melancholy and the relief of knowing we shall soon give up any thought of knowing and understanding them. There is a sense of emptiness that comes over us at evening, with the odor of the elephants. After the rain and the sandalwood ashes growing cold in the braziers, a dizziness that makes the rivers and the mountains tremble, and the fellow curves of the plain spheres where they are portrayed, and rose up one after another, the death patches announcing to us the collapse of the last enemy troops. From defeat to defeat, and the flakes, the wags of the seals of obscure kings, who、uh, beseech our army's protection, offering in exchange annual tributes of precious metals, tanned hides, and a tortoise shell. It is the desperate moment when we discover that this empire. Which had seemed to us the sum of our wonders, is an endless, formless ruin. That the corruptions, Gargani, has spread too far to be healed by our sceptre. That the triumph over enemy sovereigns has made us the heirs of their long undoing. Only in Marco Polo's accounts. Was Kublai Khan able to discern through the walls and the towers destined to crumble, the treachery of a pattern so subtle it could escape the termites knowing? Cities and the memory. Living there and proceeding for three days toward the east, you reach Diomara. A city with sixty silver domes, bronze statues of all the gods, streets paved with lead, a crystal theater, a golden cock that crows each morning on a tower. All these beauties will already be familiar to the visitor, who has seen them also in other cities. But the special quality of this city. For the man who arrives there on a September evening, when the days are growing shorter and the multicolored lamps are lighted all at once at the doors of the food stalls, and from a terrace a woman's voice cries "woo," is that he feels envy toward those who now believe they have once before they lived a evening identical to this. And who think they were happy that time? When a man passes a long time through wild regions, he feels the desire for a city. Finally, he comes to Isodora, a city where the buildings have a spiral staircases encrusted with a spiral sea shells, where perfect telescopes. And violins are made, where the foreigner hesitating between two women always encounters a third, where cockfights degenerate into bloody brawls among the batters. Among the batters, he was thinking of all these things when he desired a city, Isidora. Therefore, it's the city of his dreams, with one difference. The dreamed-of city contained him as a young man. 
he arrives at Isodora in his old age. In the square, there is a wall where the old men sit and watch the young go by. He is seated in a row with them. Desires are already memories. There are two ways of describing the city of Dorothea. You can say that four aluminum towers rise from its walls, flanking seven gates with spring-operated draw bridges that span the moat whose water feeds four green canals which cross the city, dividing it into nine quarters, each with three hundred houses and seven hundred chimneys, and bearing in mind that the nobile girls of each quarter marry youths of other quarters, and their parents exchange the goods that each family holds in monopoly. Bergmold, Surgeon Row, Astrolabs, Amethysts. You can then work from these facts until you learn everything you wish about the city in the past, present, and the future. Or else you can say, like the camel driver who took me there. I arrived here in my first youth. One morning, many people were hurrying along the streets toward the market. The women had fine teeth and looked you straight in the eye. Three soldiers on a platform played the trumpet, and all around the wheels turned and colored banners fluttered in the wind. Before then, I had known only the desert and the caravan routes. In the years that followed, my eyes returned to contemplate the desert expanses and the caravan routes. But now I know this path is only one of many that opened up before me on that morning in Dorothea. In vain, great-hearted Kublai, shall I attempt to describe Zaira, city of high bastions. I could tell you how many steps make up the streets rising like stairways, and the degree of the arcade's curves, and what kind of zinc scales cover the roofs. But I already know this would be the same as telling you nothing. The city does not, consider, does not consist of this, but of a relationship between the measurements of its space and the events of its past. The height of a lamppost and the distance from the ground of a hanged officer, a serpent's swaying feet. But the line strong from the lamppost to the railing opposite and the festoons that decorated the course of the queen's nuptial procession. The height of that railing and the leap of the adulterer who climbed over it at dawn, the tilt of a guttering and a cat's progress along it as he slips into the same window the firing range of a gunboat, which has suddenly appeared beyond the cape, and the bomb that destroys the guttering, the ribs in the fish night, and the three old men seated on a dock, mending nights and telling each other, for the hundredth time, the story of the gunboat of the usur, usurper, who some say was the Queen's illegitimate son, abandoned in his uh, swaddling clothes there on the dock. As this wave from memoirs flows in, the city soaks it up like a sponge and expands. A description of Zara as it today should contain all Zara's past. The city, however, does not tell its past, but contains it like the lines of a hand, written in the corners of the streets, the greetings, 
of the windows, the banisters of the steps, the tiny of the lighting rods, the poles of the flags, every segment marked in re- in turn with the scratches, indentations, scrawls. At the end of three days, moving southward, you come upon Anastasia, a city with a concentric canals watering it and the kites flying over it. I should now list the wares that can profitably be bought here: a gate, a nix, crystal priest, and other varieties of a. Cha si doni. I should praise the flesh of the golden pheasant, cooked here over fires of seasoned cherry wood, and sprinkled with much sweet marjoram. And tell the women I have seen bathing in the pool of a garden, and who sometimes it is said invited the stranger. To disrupt with them and chase them in the water, but with all this, I would not be telling you the city's true essence, for while the description of a、uh, Natasia awakens desires one at a time only to force you to stifle them, when you are in the heart of a、uh, Natasia, one morning, your desires awaken all at once and surround you. The city appears to you as a whole where no desire is lost, and of, of which you are a part. And since it enjoys everything you do not enjoy, you can do nothing but inhabit this desire and be content. Such as the power, sometimes called the malignant, malignant, sometimes benign, that Anastasia. The treacherous city possesses. If for eight hours a day you work as a cutter of an agate, onyx, crystal frieze, your labor, which gave the form to desire, takes from desire its form, and you believe you are enjoying Anastasia wholly when you are on. You are only its slave. Let me stop here.